Stand up with me one more time. Shake a little bit. Come on. It's going to be fun. I'll, I'll only keep you for a couple hours. Just kidding. Just kidding. I got a relative short message, but it's very impactful, and I want you to hear everything. Father, thank you so much for today, Lord. We just pray that you would open our ears to hear what the Spirit would say, that you would enable us, Father, to overcome, prevail. And Lord, I thank you for everyone that's been saved after the first service, and we thank you for everyone that will be set free in this service. Lord, thank you for blessing your people in today and giving us an ear to hear what the Spirit would say. And everyone that loved the Lord said amen and amen. amen. Go ahead and be seated, everybody. You look good this morning. Now, this morning, I, what, what I had been praying about, I, I really felt like the Lord wanted me to tell you that if you believe you're going to come out of it, you will come out of it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you in the Scriptures the depth of Jesus' death and the height of his resurrection. When you understand that, whatever you're going through in your life, if you believe you're going to come out of it, God will bring you out of it, whatever your problems may be in your life. And when I say that, I, I love this because whenever you talk about the depth of Christ's death for us, you're talking about everything that Jesus died for in his death. And when you're talking about the height of his resurrection, you're talking about everything that God has brought us to. The victory, the authority, the power. So when you understand these things and you believe that you're going to come out of it, you will come out of it with blessing. Can you say amen, everybody? It reminds me of the story of the blind man that went to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, he said, do you believe I can do this? And he said, I believe. And Jesus touched him and healed him and said, be it done unto you according as you believe. So wherever you're at, maybe you're in a bad situation. Maybe you're in a horrible situation. But if you can believe because of Christ's resurrection, if you can believe you can come out of it into the blessing of God, you will do so today in Jesus' name. Come on, everybody. Give God praise. I want you to look, if you would, up on the screen at Ephesians chapter 2. We'll use this as our text. It says, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages or the generations to come, he might show you the exceeding riches of his grace to his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Now, I know these are normal, familiar verses for most people, but let me give you a little synopsis what this is talking about. When Jesus came into this world and became like us so that he could die on the cross for us, when God raised him up, the victory that Christ received wasn't for Christ as much as it was for us. How many know that being God, you can't get, be demoted? What God did is this. He saw us in the state that we were in because of the fall of man in Genesis. And so he sent his son into this world and he added to his deity humanity. So when Jesus was raised from the dead... God was literally exalting perfect humanity in Christ all the way up to the right hand of the Father, which means the Son of Man has total dominion over this planet, over everything else. And if you're in the body of Christ, you have total dominion over what you're facing in the world today. Can you say amen? Now, look at, look at this verse in Ephesians chapter 1, and I think this will bring it out for you. Ephesians 1 says this. It says, Far above all principalities and powers and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age which is to come. Now, now, what he's saying is that when Christ was raised up, he was raised up far above. Say far above. Not just above it, but far above it. And then he goes on and he mentions this about the church. And he says that he was raised up far above every name that is named. And then he says, 
and has put all things under his feet and made him to be head over all things to the church, watch this, who is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. In other words, we are exalted in Christ far above far above any spiritual sources any forces in this world that you don't think you can handle and what's beautiful about it is you're the body of Christ if you're a believer which means the least member of the body of Christ is far above you don't have to be an apostle doesn't have to be a prophet you're far above whatever you're facing in this life that's why I say if you can believe you can come out of it that resurrection power can bring you out of it he can bring you out of a bad marriage come on and make it good he can bring you out of sickness and disease and give you hell he can come on take you he can bring you out of addiction and give you blessing but you have to believe in the power of his resurrection because it's all based on faith and faith alone will cause it to happen in your life can you say amen, amen. now I, I I heard this story from a missionary in the Philippines it kind of paints his picture in the Philippines, they have a little bit different way that they direct traffic than the way we do. And they have these little stands that they put in intersections where a police officer will sit on top of the stand. And he will direct traffic, stop them here and go like that. And everybody looks at the police officer on top of the stand. Well, one day this little boy, he wanted to get across the street, but the traffic was so bad, police officer wasn't stopping the traffic. And all of a sudden, there was a little accident down the road. So the police officer crawled down from the stand, went over, and he's attending to this accident. The little boy says, I got an idea. So he runs over to the stand, runs up under the stand, puts his hand out, and all the traffic stops. So then he runs back to the bottom of it and runs over. That's the way we are. We run up into the position of Christ. We run up into the name of Jesus. We run up into what Christ did, and through that authority we can have the dominion that God has called us to. The believer is not in a position where it cannot reign in life. He's in a position where it can. Once you believe in Christ, there, there is a spiritual resurrection that occurs within the individual. That spiritual resurrection gives the individual the power and the ability to overcome in his life. The problem is many times we don't believe we can come out of it. We don't believe that we think our problem is bigger than what it should be, and it holds us back. But I want you to know whether you're in the overflow or right here, if you believe that you can come out of it, you can come out of it because there's no limit to the power of Christ's resurrection. No power, no limit. Now, there's a verse. I want you to just write it down. I'll just be quoting these. Acts 2.38 this is after the end of Peter's sermon at the day of Pentecost. And he, he said this to the crowd that came up and said, what must we do to be saved? He said, repent. Now, repent didn't mean stop sinning. Jews believed in not sinning. Amen? The repentance was stop not believing that Jesus is the Messiah. And he says, and then he says, and be baptized. Now, watch this. For the remission of sins and then you'll receive the Holy Spirit. Now, most Christians read that and miss it. The remission of sins is more than just the forgiveness of sins. Remission means that God has not only forgiven you, but he's removed the consequences of your sins. Am I the only one happy here this morning? That means that every one of us, we have different sins in our life that we commit and there are consequences to those sins. But when you come to Christ and you believe on Christ, God not only forgives them, but if you believe you can come out of it, God can re literally remove the consequences of the sin that you did in your life. The consequence of being unfaithful, the consequence of lying, the consequence of taking drugs, the consequences of being unlovable. Those consequences, God can deliver you from that. And that's what the resurrection was because when Jesus said this or Peter said this in the book of Acts, that was after Peter got up and told the crowd, he says, you crucified Jesus. You murdered the Messiah on the cross. Now, how many of the consequences for murder is capital punishment? Now, listen to this. This is very powerful. 
You remember when Jesus was crucified and the religious leaders said, let his blood be on us? Remember that, be on our heads? AD 70, Roman Titus came around, encircled Jerusalem, and everybody within the city died. They ended up eating each other. They were so hungry. It was a terrible thing. Jesus told those who believed in him, when you see them begin to come, leave the city and go into the mountains. Why? Because he, the, even though those people that got saved that day at Pentecost were the very ones that said, crucify him, crucify him, he was removing those consequences from them. The cross removes consequences. I've seen drug addicts get delivered and not have physical problems from the drugs they had. I've seen people with AIDS that get healed of AIDS and never have to bother with it again. God is in the business of delivering. You're in the business of receiving. That's the power of the resurrection. And most of us think, okay, well, if I can make the situation right, I will. But a lot of the situations we do in our lives, we can't make it right. In fact, some of the people we've wronged may be passed away. How are you going to make it right? Or maybe you've done something in a marriage and you're in your second marriage. You can't make it right. What happened? But God says if you turn to him and believe in the resurrection, God can give you the remission of sins, not only forgive you of your sins, begin to eliminate the consequences that come from it. Now, if that doesn't get somebody in the river excited, come on, come on. That is awesome. Awesome. But that's what God will do for you. Amen? Now, what I want to do at this point of the message is I want to show you the crucifixion and show you the depths that Jesus paid to get us forgiven and, and to put us in a position to be resurrected. How far did it go? And let me just say it this way. When Jesus was crucified on the cross, it was nine in the morning when he was crucified. He didn't give up his spirit until three o'clock that afternoon so here's how it went the bible says he was bruised for iniquity and the chastisement of our peace was by him by him and by his stripes we were healed the torture that jesus went through was to redeem us from the sins that we committed now on that cross for the first three and a half hours he was experiencing the pain and the torment of the thorns and the scourging and the lashing on the back that came from the cat of nine tails, which tears your flesh off. He was experiencing that pain. But something happened at, at noon that was very unique. Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And all of a sudden, Jesus began to experience not just physical pain from sin, but now he's experiencing spiritual death. Hebrews said that he tasted death for every man. In other words, on that cross, Jesus experienced being spiritually dead, experienced separation from God. Now, if you've been unsaved for a while, you know what I'm talking about, and you come to Christ, you know the difference. But he had never experienced that before in his life, and he did it on the cross. Now, what I want you to see from this, which I think will really help you, is at the point that he did this, he began to experience a level of suffering that's hard to put in words. And most people, they, they don't understand that his suffering wasn't just on the cross. There was still a period of separation from God when he went in the grave. And I'll give you an example. You remember at the end of it, he said it is finished and commended his spirit to the Father and then he died. Where did his spirit go? Where did his soul go when he died? He, was, he told everybody that the sign you're gonna have is that it's gonna be like Jonah, three days and night in the, heart, in the belly of the fish, but for me it's gonna be three days and night in the heart of the earth. Where did Jesus go for three days? We know his body was in the tomb. Where did his spirit go? Where did his soul go? Well, he told the thief on the cross, he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Now, this is where a lot of people don't understand. Paradise is not what we would call heaven. Paradise is in a region the Bible calls Shiloh or Hades in the Greek. 
it was a, a place that God kept people until Jesus died on the cross and paid the price for their sin. Jesus talked about it in a true story when he said there was a certain rich man who lived very presumptuous or a very uh, wild lifestyle and it said that, that he died while this beggar outside of his house was ex asking for alms and so forth and they both died and he went to Hades, a place of torment and he said that there was a gulf in between that and Abraham's bosom is what he says where the beggar was and the guy that was in Hades said, can you have Lazarus just come over with, put some water on his finger and come and touch my tongue? So obviously there was torment in Hades. But there was this region, it was called paradise or Abraham's bosom. When Jesus said, today I'll be with you in paradise, he was talking to the thief on the cross who had believed on him. And so as soon as Jesus died and descended, he descended into the upper regions of paradise. And he was with the Old Testament saints, Jeremiah, uh, David, all those who believed in, the, in God and the Savior and all that. Uh, they were all in this place that was kept for them because they couldn't go to heaven yet. In other words, it had to wait until the resurrection. Once the resurrection occurred, then Jesus, it says, he ascended, descended to the lower regions and, and led captive captive and he took the Old Testament saints and they were born in kin and they raised up on high and went to heaven. There was never been anybody in heaven until that occurred. Never happened. See, it wasn't enough to cover your sins. You had to have the sin completely removed. So when Jesus was resurrected after three days, Peter, he gets in some great detail. He said that Jesus not only descended, he descended into the abyss where the angels who had been disobedient during the time of Noah were. And it says he proclaimed something to them. It doesn't say what the message was. But I imagine it was this. During Noah's time, the angels came and intermingled with women. And what they were trying to do is corrupt humanity so that the word of God could not become flesh. And so Jesus comes down and says, I'm here, you're there, and I've resurrected, and I'm ascending on high. Your efforts to stop me did not stop. I am the firstborn from the dead. There's going to be the second. There's going to be a third. There's going to be fourth. There's going to be fifth. There's going to be five. And so he rose up victorious. And I love what he said to Mary. You remember she went to the garden tomb to treat the body of Jesus and he'd been raised from the dead and she didn't recognize. She thought it was the gardener, it was Jesus. And she came over and tried to touch Jesus and said, don't touch me. I have not ascended on high. And see, he had to go all the way up into heaven and put his blood on the mercy seat. That's why the veil of the temple was rent from the top to the bottom. Where now, because of Jesus Christ, we can go to the Father, we can receive mercy, we can receive grace, we can receive all of that in our lives. Well, that's good preaching. That's good preaching. But, you know, a lot of people, they don't see some of the symbolism in this that is really powerful, and I want to give you just a little bit of it so you'll you be ministered to. You remember Jesus at the end, right before he died, said, it is finished. But I want you to understand that Jesus in Scripture is referred to as the Passover lamb. He said he is the first and the last. In other words, there's never going to be anybody else needed he is the last lamb that will be offered. See, Jesus was crucified on Passover weekend for the Jews. 2,556 lambs were slain during Passover. And here's what they would do every Passover. The high priest would take a lamb that was without blemish, and he would take it to Jerusalem. And all the people were told, go out and get palm leaves and we'll celebrate as the lamb comes into Jerusalem. Jesus gets on a donkey, comes in and everybody starts celebrating him. Why? Because he is the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. All the religious leaders got so angry, they wanted to kill Jesus and they did. They crucified him. 
And Jesus said, if I don't do this, the rocks will cry out. Why? Because he is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Can you say amen? Praise God. But during Jesus, his beating and the cross and all that, the last lamb that was slain was the one that the high priest had and that ended the Passover. That's when it ended. And guess what time that was? Three o'clock in the afternoon. Jesus said, it is finished at three o'clock in the afternoon. The high priest ended Passover at that exact moment. He slew the lamb and then said, get a hold of this. It is finished. Jesus does it on the cross because we don't need any more lambs. We've got the lamb of God. One sacrifice for all. Glory. Glory. That's why I say if you believe in Christ, if you believe you can come out of your problem, you can come out of it. How many know that marriages have problems? Children, you have problems with children. There are all kinds of things that sin creates problems in, but you can come out of it if you believe in the resurrected Christ because his power is greater than any problem you're facing. But you've got to believe you can come out of it. I believe I can come out of that with Christ. I believe I can come out of it with that resurrected power. I believe I can come out of it with the authority of the name of Jesus. I believe I can come out of that depression. I believe I can come out of that addiction. I believe I can come out of that disharmony in my family. I believe I can come out of it. Man, that's powerful. But many people, they don't seem to do that. Because remember, when Jesus went in the grave, he tested death for everyone. And it says that he's the last and the first and he's been given the keys of death and Hades. The keys of death and Hades. I don't know if you understand this, but the Bible talks about a second death. Not for believers, but for those who have not accepted Christ. And it's called the second death is because there's no more after it. It's over with. Jesus was the first human being that was resurrected who is a resurrection is everlasting. Lazarus raised from the dead, but he died again. Jesus did something for us that cannot be taken away from us. But if you are in a position where you are experiencing the second death and you haven't accepted Christ you're in a whole lot of hurt. Now, if you bear with me, turn to your neighbor and say, this is going to be really good, I can tell. Come on, turn to the other and say, you need to hear this whether you like it or not. (laughs) Revelation, and just write this down for reference. Revelation, this is uh, chapter 20, verse 11 through 15. It talks about the great white throne judgment. And I'm going to show you one of the, the biggest lies in the world today in the, in, in the event John says this he says the, those that have died the great and the small he's talking about people that died without Christ it says they'll stand before the great white throne judgment and the books will be open these are books of works and each one will be judged according to his works and then it says another book is open and it's called the Lamb's Book of Life. And it says that they look through the book to make sure that person's not name is not found in that book. And if the name is not found in that book, the person is cast into the lake of fire for eternity. Now here's the part I want you to see. The biggest lie in the world today is that Good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell. That's the biggest lie. People think if I'm just a good person, I'm going to go to heaven. None of those who had good works, great works, were good enough to go to heaven. You have to have your name written in the Lamb's book of life. And it's not, listen, that name is written because of what Christ did. 
not because of what you do. You get saved, not because you're a good person. It can produce good works, but you're saved because of his works. You're saved because of his righteousness. You're saved because of his obedience. You're saved because of him, him alone. That's why you're saved. Well, I'm not a bad person. I'm thinking if God's a good God, I'll end up in heaven. No. That's why he gave us Jesus. And here's the amazing thing. This really shows the love of God. Did you know in the Bible there is no reference to when names are written in the, in the Lamb's Book of Life? There is no reference. All the scriptures, no reference. The only thing that is told us is a warning not to be blotted out of the book. In other words, God has pre-registered every person. He's pre-registered all of us for eternal life. All of us for it. But if we don't accept Christ and you die without Christ, your name will get blotted out. But if you come to Christ before you die and don't say, well, I'll just party on and when I'm going to die. No, no, no. You can't get saved unless God draws you. You can't get saved unless God draws you in the kingdom. You can't just do that. It won't work that way. That means every baby, every child, every, every child that has been lost in an abortion or whatever, every one of those children are, are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I don't want to get into that message altogether, but what I want you to hear is this. Wherever you're at today, if you haven't accepted Christ, God put your name in the book, and now he's using me to preach to you and the Spirit of God is drawing you because he wants you to accept his son today. He doesn't want your name to get blotted out. He wants you to accept Christ as your Savior. Whew. There's not a person in this world that is unredeemable. Everybody is redeemable. You ever um, get in a fender bender with your car? And you go to the insurance company and they look at it and sometimes they go, it costs too much to fix it. We'll just junk the car. It's not worth fixing. And they total it out. God doesn't total any of you out. I said he doesn't total any of you out. You're not unredeemable. All you got to do is believe on Christ, receive his son. And you can only do that when God's spirit is drawn. You can't do it any other, any other way. Now, some people say, well, pastor, you know, I, uh, you know, I know I've sinned and do this kind of stuff. And, and you know, I, I think I'm going to go to heaven eventually. And God's not going to punish me in hell forever, is he? I, I hate to tell you this, but he does. And it's not because of your sin. It's because of the sin nature inside of you. When you come to Christ, you become a new creature in Christ Jesus. And without the divine nature of God inside of you, you can't fellowship with God. And that's why sinners stay in the lake of fire. It's not because of their list of sin. It's because they never accepted Christ. you got to accept Christ as your Savior. And you got to embrace him so, that so you can partake of the divine nature of God in your life. <laughs> Woo, man. Do you ever... Preach yourself happy, I just did. It's powerful. Now what I want you to do is stand up right now as we bring this thing down. I'm so excited about this. This is so powerful. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm pre-registered. Now turn to you and say, I need to sign up for it, what I'm pre-registered to. That means if you accept Christ, there's not anything in your life that you cannot come out of if you believe him for it. No, absolutely nothing. His resurrection pattern has no limits. Now let me give you an example how this works. This is personal. How many know being a husband, one of the things you try to do with your wife is give her everything that would make her happy? You love to do that. Amen? Before I was saved, I was like that. I want to keep my wife happy. If I can afford it, I'll give it to her, whatever. And I did that. But I wasn't saved. And her mother died at an early age, way too young to die. She was so crushed from it, and I couldn't do anything about it. I mean, I, what are you going to do? I can't raise, raise her mom from the dead. 
she was really crushed, and in her point of despair, she turned towards God. And what happened is she was driving by a church, and the Holy Spirit came upon her. And she went to that church, and she got saved. And she didn't get a little saved. She got radically saved. Now, I understand she's radically saved, married to a radical sinner. The worst sinner on the block, she's married to. Dope smoking, beer drinking, wine guzzling, coke snorting, sinner. Maybe you got a bigger list, but that's what it was. And she prayed for me. At the time she prayed for me, I had been out of work. She said, Lord, I'm asking just two things. I want you to save my husband and get him a job. Now, some of you women say, amen. Amen. And I remember she went to church, and I was at home. And she was at church, and I was watching sci-fi theater, minding my own business. All of a sudden, I hear this voice says, I want you to get up and I want you to open that Bible over there and read it. Your wife is not here so you don't have to feel ashamed. He said, why would God say that? Because that's why I didn't read the Bible. I felt like that's for sissies. So I got up after that voice spoke to me and I opened the Bible and it fell to Proverbs. And as I began to read through this, it began to describe all my flunky friends. Only time they came over is when I had beer in the refrigerator. And, and I begin to realize there has to be a God to reveal this to me. And I remember she came home. I said, baby, I, I don't want to alarm you, but I heard a voice. And God told me to read the Bible. And I, and I read the Bible and at the, the middle of it. And I believe God exists. And she looks at me like a dog at a new bone. And I said, I, I don't know what it is, but I've got to go to church and get saved. I know I've got to go to church and get saved. I didn't know how to get saved. I mean, I had been in the Catholic Church for years and didn't know how to get saved. And we went the next week. And I remember in the this, in this service, I was in the back. Those unbelievers are in the back. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm not talking about you. A different group. But I was in the back with my wife, and the preacher preached, and I don't even remember the sermon. I don't even remember the sermon. But I remember the altar call. And he said, if you want to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, raise up your hand. And I remember I raised my hand up, and other people raised their hands up, and then he led everybody to the sinner's prayer, whatever. And I sat down, and then we left the service. And I said, Lord, nah, it wasn't right. I didn't, it didn't, something's not right here. I, I, this isn't adequate. And I told my wife, I said, uh, I'm, I'm going to go back next week. I, I'm asking the Lord to talk to the pastor, have him do it right. <laughs> you know, uh, this, just, this ain't adequate. So for a whole week, I wasn't saying, I wasn't born again, because you can tell the difference. And the next week I went, and she brought a girl, a girl, a neighbor girl to us, to the church too and, and I went in there I don't remember the sermon but I remember when the altar call came I felt the drawing power of the Holy Spirit in my life and if, I mean when I went in the church I was blown away because people raised their hands like what kind of people are these they're not afraid they're, they're not ashamed of Jesus not like religious but anyway I, the power of God just fell on me and I raised my hand in the past says, I want you to come forward. And I remember stepping out of that aisle and, uh, and it was me, just me. And the power of God was so strong, it, it began to fall on me. And I, as I walked forward, I just fell to my knees. And, and then all these people came around me speaking in these strange languages and laying hands on me. And all of a sudden, I felt this heavy weight just lift off me. Whew. Man. 
I was changed so badly that I told my wife and her friend, I said, you came with Jack, but you're leaving with somebody different. And I didn't even know the verse that said, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things that pass will be old, all things come new. I, I didn't even know that verse, but there was such a difference. In, in fact, and I'll just give a little sidestep, I was a terrible foul mouth fellow. Every other word was the F word. I was bad. But after I got up off my knees, I had to learn new words because I didn't know how to talk. God removed the sin, which, which came from the anger, the hostility and all that, and it's just gone. Well, I'm here today to tell you that that same Jesus is alive. Same Jesus. He's alive. And I, I didn't know when I got saved to be called me to the ministry that I would see thousands and thousands of people saved through this ministry. I had no idea what God would do. I had no idea he was going to build this church and do what he did, but he's alive. He's alive. So I'm not, I'm not trying to get people saved by some man-made doctrine. I'm trying to get you to come to Christ with someone who's alive. And the Holy Spirit is here to draw you. Many of you have problems in your life. You just don't believe you can come out of it. If you turn your life to Christ, you can believe you can come out of it. But you've got to turn your life to Christ. You got to believe that that resurrection power and what he did not only removes your sins but gives you the power to overcome in your life and here's what i'd like you to do i'd like you to lift your hand up to heaven right now and say oh i need that pastor i need that come on be, don't for, forget about your relatives you come to jesus you come to jesus thank you 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 Thank you, thank you. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to just tell the person next to you, let me out, I gotta get down front. I want you to come down front, we're gonna pray for you. Come on out, come on, come on, it's good, it's good, it's good. Give, give God praise, this is awesome. Come on forward everybody, come on. We're gonna pray. Come on, give God, give him some praise. Give him some praise. Give him some praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Woo! Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Love you, Jesus. Love you, Jesus. Love you, Jesus. Love you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. The greatest joy in my life, outside of being married to the greatest woman on the planet, is leading people to Jesus. Because if He can use me, think what he can do with you if he can take someone that's on no on a road to nowhere and turn them around think what he can do for you i want all of us to pray this together up front say this with me heavenly father i come to you in the name of jesus i believe that you sent your son to die for me and i believe that you rose him up for my justification. And you said in your word, Lord, that if I confess him as Lord of my life, you would forgive me of my sins and give me the remission of sins. Thank you, Lord, for removing the consequences and removing the sins in my life. And Father, I declare today with all my heart, with all my mind, that Jesus is my 
Lord. Give God praise, everybody. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now get your hands up. We're going to pray for the Holy Ghost. Father, we pray right now that your Holy Spirit would come upon them, not just for a visit, but to live. Father, let your Holy Spirit seal their hearts, seal their minds, seal their inner spirit. Father, thank you for moving by the power of your Spirit. Thank you for the many gifts and callings you called them to. Thank you, Lord, for what you're about to do. Futures are being formed right now. Futures past are being formed right now. Roads are being formed right now. Father, thank you so much. Lord, we give you praise for it. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Give the Lord praise, everybody. Woo! Yes. Now listen, before you leave, uh, go to Steve right there. He wants to give you something. Just grab it from him and you're gone. Uh, so just stay up front. We've got uh, Pastor Jim there. So we got two groups to talk to Pastor Jim or Steve. They just want to give you something before you go. So go home with something. Anyway, listen, we love all of you so much. Thank you for coming for Easter. We love you. May the Lord bless you continually in your life in Jesus' name.